if you want to be confused, every book that you ever pick up begin on page 15. If you want to be confused with every book you pick up, start on page 15. Maybe one of the most confusing things we do in church is that we read little excerpts. We read what's called a pericope. We pick up in the middle of a story. And it leaves us terribly confused. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. We pick up there and it would seem that the topic that the topic that Paul wants to talk about, the thing that he wants us to see is the wrath of God. When we bump into somebody that is in Barna's stop three, stop three is where a person begins to be concerned about the implications of personal sin. I define the implication of personal sin only by my own experience. You see, I don't know that I'm right for you. I can only share with you my experience. In my experience of personal sin, it always feels the same. It feels like shame. In other words, I want to go hide. I want to hide from you. I want to hide from God. But most of all, I want to hide from myself. That's the implication. Personal sin. Guilt's a little better. At least guilt is shame that's ready to come out. I'm ready to bring it out in the open, but I'm not quite ready yet. I still don't want you to know it. I'm not even sure if I want to know it. And so I'll try another tack with personal sin. Patty, you made eye contact with me. That's all it takes. I'll blame you. You should be used to it by now. We do that to each other. How do you help a person like that? How do you help a person? How do you make a disciple of a person that is struggling with the implications of personal sin? Doc, you put me on the spot this morning. Dr. Larry back there put me on the spot. He put the whole class on the spot. The question you ask of us is the same question I'm trying to answer today. How do you help a person who is convinced that they're wrestling with sin and they've got it in their head, this opening sentence here, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed. How do you help a person that is wrestling with personal sin, that is convinced, convinced, that God is going to take all His wrath out upon them? You see, I would want to introduce the person to the truth that's in this passage. Not because they're going to accept it, because if if your experience, if their experience is anything like my experience, this truth is so simple and so complex, it's hard to get our mind wrapped around it. And that's the reason why the great commandment calls us to use three parts. We're complex individuals. 
Love God with all your heart. Feelings, guys. Emotions. We have feelings and emotions. Feelings and emotions stir us around. They feel like fear, but they also feel like love. They also feel like joy. I'll let you decide which one you want to pick. What's the truth here? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. And we would ask, well, what is the truth? Well, it's not a what. The truth is who? God did not create you and I to be what's. God created you and I to be who. Who we are. Who we are called to be. His people of faith. Look back at verse 16. I'm in Romans chapter 1. Look back at verse 16. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. You see, the person who is struggling with the personal implications of sin has the Holy Spirit in their life working on them. The Holy Spirit is at work before they even know it. The Holy Spirit is at work leading them to the truth of the gospel. And the truth is the person, the second person of the Trinity, and he bears a name. And what is his name, church? His name is Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. And we are led to the second person of the Trinity by the third person of the Trinity, who is the Holy Spirit. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. And so let us not be ashamed, or rather, Father, help me. <laughs> help me. Not to be ashamed to sit with a sister or a brother that is weighted down by the implications personal sin. In other words, the experience of sin is shame and guilt and blame. But it's caused by two things. That's the experience. And the experience arises from what's going on in this thing that my grandmother used to call the noodle. <laughs> you know, the noodle. It's what's going on in the noodle. And we in Western culture think this has the final answer to everything. There's two things going on in the noodle. The first thing here is this is a wonderful organ. It does a marvelous job. It helps us navigate the world. Do not, I told a friend of mine that, was a, that is a counselor one time, try, do not try to get rid of your mind. And she thought I was talking about the brain. And she said, you dummy, you'd be dead if you got rid of that. Don't try to get rid of your mind. I'm not talking about the brain. I'm talking about logic and reason and judgment. You hear the last word that I said? Judge. Jesus warns us again and again and again. Do not be the judge. Do not be the judge. So guess what I want to be? Guess the role that I want to play. I know that I'm not the judge, but I'll tell you what I'll do from time to time. I will be the prosecuting attorney. My job is not to be the prosecuting attorney. 
You know, the prosecuting attorney is the one that sees all your flaws. Everything you're doing wrong. And I just want to prove that you're wrong and that I am, what's the word? Oh, thank you. See, we know this. We just want to prove ourselves right. Sometimes we're the defense attorney. Oh, here, let me defend you. As if that's going to lead you to the Lord. Defending you ain't going to get you there. Then get me there. Prosecuting you, is that going to get you there? Don't think so. You begin to prosecute me, it makes the wrath of God even more powerful. Now I'm worried about God going to whack me. Now you want to whack me. Is this the way we make disciples? It's what I was taught in seminary. Alberta, it's what I was taught to do as a pastor. To play the role of defense attorney, a prosecutor. And so Job, you see, he, he demanded an audience with God. I encourage you to give that a try. You know why? Because that's exactly what God wants with the person who is struggling with the personal implication of sin. That's exactly what God wants. God wants to have an audience. God wants to sit down. That's the point. How many of you have ever seen the movie Bruce Almighty? Oh gosh, I'm in trouble. Not that many. Yeah. Yeah, so for, for, for a few days, Bruce gets to be God. Because, you know, we all think that we can do better than God. And so he gets to be God. And it scares him half to death. I mean, scares him half to death at the parting of the tomato soup. <laughs> Have to watch a movie. Morgan Pr Freeman is the one playing the role of God, and there's this point in the movie where, 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 <laughs> where Jim Carrey is scared half to death because he's now in the role of God. He's finally getting to do what he thought he could always, well, if I was God, I could do it better. That's sin. If I was God, then I know I could do it better than God. Now, there's sin right there. He's all confused, and finally, he turns to Morgan Freeman, and he asks, can I ask you a question? <laughs> Morgan Freeman just gets all excited. I mean, just beside himself, gets all excited and says, yes! That's the point. What do you think prayer is, church? What do you think prayer is? It's a person who feels that they're a piece of garbage. <laughs> it's a person who feels... Their piece of garbage deserves the wrath of God. He finds himself in sacred ground. And God does the most amazing of all things. We'll listen to your questions and give you answers. We'll listen to your questions give you answers. If you know somebody who's struggling with the personal implications of sin, I've said this once, I'm going to say it again. Take them on a camping trip. You see, there's two things that have got to get out of the way for a person to be able to to wrestle with the personal implications of sin. And the first is judgment. And taking them on a camping trip 
will help them surrender and drop their judgment quicker than anything in the world. You see, there's judgment. And the moment that you convince yourself, the moment that I convince myself that I'm Miss Nancy's judge, then I can be in control of Miss Nancy. And isn't that the sin of the world? We want to judge so that we can control. We want to judge because we want to be in control of everything. And so I'll tell you, take them on a camping trip. If you're wrestling with the personal implications of sin, go on a camping trip. And give God two hours of your time in the dead of night and you look up and behold the heavens, and you tell me, can you control it? Can you control it? Read what I've written if you dare to. You see, what I wrote in that piece of paper is all about knowledge. I'm talking about having an experience of it. We watch the sun rise, and we say, oh, isn't that marvelous? And then some days I see the sun setting, and I think, where did the day go? And you know what I want to do when I say, where did the day go? Oh, I want to be in control because God didn't put enough hours in the day, you see. And so who in here has the power to take a setting sun and lift it back up again? Come on, anybody here? Is there anybody in this room that has the power to change something? whirling of the universe. The physicists keep trying to figure this out and that thing just keeps doing what it's doing because God created it to do what it do and they're trying to figure out how to control it and they can't figure it out. My grandmother called it a noodle. There's something wrong. The, the noodles had cooked too much. Andrew and I were sitting in the backyard the other day. I've already told you this. I didn't say this to her then. I may get it beat up for it now. But, you know, you know, you know the nice thing about marriage, when you get in a fight and you get beat up, you get the makeup. Isn't that great? Andrea looked up. She, we were looking at the stars, and she said, have you ever thought about who we are that God would be mindful of us? I tell you what, you get somebody struggling with the personal implications of sin that can come to that aha moment, and I'll tell you what will happen. They will begin a journey. If my experience is anything, it took that to convince me that I can't be the judge, but I'll still try to play prosecuting attorney sometimes. And sometimes, oh, I'll try to be your defender as if I can take away your sin. Can I take away your sin? Anybody here? Is there anybody in this room that has the power and authority to change the course of the heavens and the earth and to forgive someone's sin, to take their sin away? Not a one. So what gets in our way? You see, I want to be the judge because as long as I'm the judge, it puts me in control. Drop the judgment. We lose control. Drop the judgment. We lose control. So what is the truth, church? Drop judgment. Lose control. 
And then and only then, I contend, are we ready to read verse 17. For in it, meaning faith, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith as it is written. The one who is righteous doesn't say right. When I'm the judge, I just want to be right. When I'm the prosecuting attorney, I just want to be right. When I'm the defense attorney, I just want to prove that I'm right. The one who is righteous in the sight of God. Live by faith. Here's my faith. I have faith that Jesus was born of Mary in the same way I was born of Margaret. Here's my faith. Jesus suffered. Don't tell me you don't suffer. Don't tell me that your neighbor doesn't want to control you and judge you and that you want to do the same. Jesus suffered. And Jesus died. But the death that he died, my friends, was to sin. And the way he died to sin was that he had faith in the Father who spoke the light of the sun and the stars and the reflecting moons and set them all in their courses in the heavens. He placed his faith because when Jesus hung on the cross, he was not the judge. When Jesus hung on the cross, he gave up all control. He humbled himself. And even though he was equal to God, he didn't count himself as God. Because Jesus was sent, my friends, not to condemn. He wasn't sent as a prosecuting attorney. He wasn't sent as a simple defense attorney. He was sent to save the whole world. That's all of creation. That's the sun and the moon and the stars and the trees and the rocks. Pick up a rock. And listen to it shout with joy. Pick up a rock. And feel it and experience it shout with joy. For even the rock knows who made it. Do you know the one who made you? Do you know that he loves you? And that his love is greater than your sin. And that he meets you in your suffering. Not to condemn you. But to heal you. And I said this was going to be a short sermon. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I shut my mouth, but 